Thank you very much. It, I think one of the biggest honors in my life was being named Professor Emeritus of GUI Oncology and following in Dr. Sampson's footsteps. Um, and I know that um, you all know Dr. Sampson as the father of endometriosis, but I hope by the end of this short talk, okay, by the end of this short talk, yeah, you'll appreciate the genius of this extraordinary man and understand his legacy. So just to lay some background, Dr. Sampson was born in 1873 in Brunswick, New York, approximately 10 miles northeast of Albany Medical Center. He attended Troy Academy and then Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts. He entered Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in 1895, graduating cum laude in 1899 in their third medical class. You should note that um, Johns Hopkins Hospital was started in 18, 1889. In 1900, Dr. Sampson began his residency at Johns Hopkins under Dr. Howard Kelly another giant in our field, and you may know him from the Kelly clan. Over his career, Dr. Sampson published 67 articles, all but two as the sole author. Interestingly, Dr. Sampson trained at a time when gynecologists did their own pathology. Upon completion of his residency in 1905, Dr. Sampson moved to Albany, New York, where he continued to practice for the next 40 years. He was the first chairman of the department of OBGYN at Albany Medical College and Hospital. Um, prior to that, the department of gynecology was part of the department of surgery. Carcinoma of the cervix was the focus of Dr. Sampson's early career. During his residency, he published 18 articles on cervical cancer based on a systematic examination of multiple surgical specimens the first article in 1902 discussed a type 5 extended radical hysterectomy to ensure removal of the entire cancer. Remember, this was prior to radiation therapy, which was first applied in 1903. And during their surgery, you have to remember, they were using drop ether. There are no IVs, no blood transfusions. I mean, it, it, it was remarkable. So in these procedures, Dr. Sampson and colleagues removed the distal ureters, plus or minus the bladder, and uh, they performed neocystotomies. In five subsequent articles published in 1904, now he's a resident, senior resident, he published five articles in 1904, and they're long. You know, he discussed the relationship of the ureters, the bladder, and the rectum to the cervical cancer, and also their relationship to the radical surgical procedures. The last article here describes the pathogenesis and the step-by-step -step repair of vesical vaginal fistulas. If you ever want to read a nice surgical article, it's well written. So this all culminated in this summary article. This was delivered at the American Medical Society in 1904. Again, he was a fourth year resident. At the same meeting, he also delivered this treatise to the pathology section, describing the ureteric sheet and its relation to carcinoma of the cervix. Dr. Stamson did extensive research on the ureter in 1904, and this research is still some of the basis for urologic teaching. This paper became the definitive article on the blood supply to the ureter. By injecting the various arteries, he demonstrated the arterial plexus from the kidney to the bladder. And Dr. Sampson illustrated his own articles, and these were his illustrations from that article on the blood supply. In a paper delivered in 1905 to the gynecologic section of the International Congress of Arts and Sciences in St. Louis, Dr. Sampson discussed the importance of early diagnosis and improving prognosis for cancer of the cervix. He pointed out the barriers 
to early diagnosis. Patient ignorance, poverty, and race. Failure of physicians to even bother to examine their patients. And then he talked about tumor growth patterns that did not give rise to early symptoms. And just to contrast that, this is a paper delivered this year at the SGO annual meeting, you know, which basically says the same thing 120 years later. So mind me if I'm not impressed. This paper was a study of the paramecium and carcinoma of the cervix was Dr. Sampson's thesis as he finished his residency. He expanded his investigation at this time to 27 patients. And those are his illustrations from that paper. At Albany Med, Dr. Sampson continued investigating a variety of topics. There are several on the blood supply of the uterus, tubes, and ovaries. But the most important is the last article written in 1917, where he showed particles escaping from the uterine cavity into the venous lymphatic channels, but only during menstruation. This became important later in his theory regarding the origin of endometriosis. And these are the radiographs from, from his articles regarding blood supply to the uterus and the ovary. In them, he injected bismuth into the uterine arteries of autopsy specimens and then took the radiographs. Dr. Sampson's expertise was widely acknowledged during his lifetime. These radiographs of Dr. Sampson's were published in the 1917 Northwestern Annual Update in Practical Medicine Gynecology. And these were actually a, a term stillborn. Well, 1921. This is why we are, you're all gathered here today to honor Dr. Sampson. Perforating hemorrhagic cysts of the ovary. This is a long article which I've distilled down for brevity. Although I'll say most of his articles were extremely long. They're like 50 pages with illustrations. I mean, I don't know how they were ever published. Um, <clears throat> but all of you recognize the gross description that he wrote here. Dense, adherent, easily ruptured, chocolate-filled cysts, adhesions that sometimes simulate malignancy. I will tell you as a GYN oncologist, I'd rather operate on cancer than bad endometriosis. Um, and the microscopic description, cysts lined by the epithelium, resting on vascular stroma, sometimes containing gland-like structures resembling endometrial glands, old hemorrhage. This definition continues to be the standard today. So this was the first in a series of 18 articles of endometriosis written by Dr. Sampson over his lifetime. And he felt at this time that the extra ovarian lesions were a result of implantation following cyst rupture. And he referred to this later as his first step. In these two landmark articles from 1922, Dr. Sampson describes two important concepts. In the first, he describes retrograde menstruation, as he had noticed numerous cases of endometriosis where the ovaries did not contain chocolate cysts. And in the second, he noted that endometriosis lesions react to life events in a similar manner as the mucosa of the uterine cavity. And this is, was extremely important later. In 1925, Dr. Sampson uses the term endometriosis for the first time. And he said the term endometriosis is more descriptive than mullerianosis. And I still can't say mullerianosis. I just, I can't say it. It's, it's just too much. And these were illustrations of gross findings with the photomicrographs that were attached. Um, up until 1921, Dr. Sampson did all of his own illustrations for his articles. But starting in 1921, they were done by Miriam Ruth Oliver Marden, who also trained at Hopkins. In 1927, Dr. Sampson puts forth his theory on the origin of endometriosis. He first talks about direct endometriosis, which we now call adenomyosis, 
he talked about the retrograde menstruation, intraoperative transplantation like that, which would be in a scar, and then about vascular spread from the uterus. And these are more colored illustrations. These are in the original reprints, and these are from my own archives. But back to the GYN oncology. In 1931, paper, implantation peritoneal carcinomatosis of ovarian origin. Dr. Sampson hypothesized essentially that cells escape from the cancer, multiply in the ascites, eventually implant on the peritoneal surface where they cause inflammation, exudate, and, fib and fibrin forms and the tumors become embedded, continuing to grow, which isn't much different than endometriosis. This paper published in 1936 essentially described neoangiogenesis in metastatic cancer, which when you think about it, this presages the development of anti-angiogenesis drugs like bevacizumab that came 60 years later. Just remarkable. In this 1936 article, Dr. Sampson describes adenocarcinoma of the endometrium with involvement of the tubes and ovaries. This built on two previous papers published in 1924 and 1925. The first, benign and malignant endometrial implants in the peritoneal cavity. And the second, endometrial carcinoma of the ovary arising in endometrial tissue in that organ. The latter was the first to illustrate endometrial cancer arising from endometriosis without a uterine lesion. In the 1936 article, Dr. Sampson just described the mechanism of tumor spreading through vascular and lymphatic channels, direct extension, and transtubal migration. So this is a descriptive paper from 1937, Lymphatics of the Mucosa of the Fembrae of the Fallopian Tube. And then this article, this 1938 article, is a 35-page treatise that first piqued my interest in Dr. Sampson. Dr. Sampson describes involvement of the fallopian tube secondary to carcinoma of the ovary. And I quote, two small carcinomas of the ampular mucosa of the right tube, which represented the appearance of having arisen either from the tubal epithelium or from the implantation of cancer cells. How can we account for the large number of instances in which secondary tumors were situated in the distal portion of the fallopian tube? So between this paper and the previous paper, Dr. Sampson was so very close to postulating a fallopian tube origin of metastatic cancer in 1938, a concept readily accepted today, but only in the last 15 to 20 years. And then this invited paper of in 1940, Dr. Sampson summarized his life's work in endometriosis. And as opposed to all the other papers, this paper is only about five pages long. Mm -hmm. oh Excuse me. So he, this is where he summarized his three-step hypothesis. One, implantation from rupture of the ovarian cyst, retrograde menstruation, and secondary spread from other foci in the peritoneal cavity. And Dr. Sampson was actually quite humble, and he really didn't get into arguments with Dr. Novak. And stuff. They had intellectual discussions. But this was his closing paragraph in that small paper. If bits of malaria mucosa carried by menstrual blood escaping into the peritoneal cavity are always dead, the, impl the implantation theory, as presented by me, also is dead and should be buried and forgotten. If some of these bits are even occasionally alive, the implantation theory also is alive. Dr. Sampson was very interested in education and was an excellent teacher in the operating room, on rounds, and in the classroom. 
In his presidential address to the American Gynecologic Society in 1923, he stressed the importance of teaching pathology to cl clinicians, and especially gynecologists, and I quote, to do their very best work, clinicians should be fundamentally and eternally pathologists, and pathologists should at least occasionally be clinicians. And note, he also developed a problem-based curriculum for his residents and students in 1907. Now, we, we think we're so smart, you know, it's like, he just felt that his didactic lectures were so bad that he did problem-based medicine. Dad, he, your time is getting tight. Okay. Dr. Sampson wrote on a number of other um, subjects. I just point out, too, the one on extraperitoneal neocystotomies under local anesthesia from 1905. And the last paper on the problems of applying intrauterine radium capsules. Dr. Samson was an extremely generous man. Um, patient, he, he wouldn't even send them a bill. He'd pay their hospital bills. He, he would pay the tuition for the medical students. And in 1940, he gave $100,000 to Albany Hospital and $100,000 to Albany Medical College. They were two separate institutions. That would be a large amount today. Dr. Samson died at the age of uh, 73 in 1946. And he donated the majority of his estate to those two institutions, an amount that would be equivalent to 13 million today. He also donated his camp in Grafton to the town, which ultimately became Grafton State Park. And this is an obituary. Um, he, he not only treated with the best surgical skills at his command, but also with a rare human sympathy and understanding. And I'd like to acknowledge, firstly, Dr. Phil Clement, whose history of gynecologic pathology, Dr. Samson, I used as a guide, the archivist at Albany Medical Center, and especially Ms. Helen Buchan. Ms. Buchan was Dr. Samson's histology technician and later my patient. And she, was, she left me all of her archives, which stimulated my interest in this most extraordinary man. And this is a letter typed by Dr. Sampson and sent to Ms. Buckham when she was um, being treated for a TB in a sanitarium upstate. And he was worried about the implantation theory at that time. But that is his signature. His, his handwriting's atrocious. And this is actually a first edition of Dr. Novak's textbook of <coughs> pathology. And I read the flyleaf to Ms. Helen Buckham as a tribute to her long association with the epic-making work of John A. Sampson, my good friend of many years, cordially, Emil Novak, 1951.